love connected driving. And with a vehicle like this, you have to stay connected. If you love classic cars, then Donald loves you. Welcome to another edition of the Audrain Automobile Museum's YouTube channel Winter Driving Series. You know, this is where we explore the fact that just because winter has come doesn't mean that driving has to be boring or routine. Today I'm driving a 1973 Toyota FJ40 Land Cruiser. And this is a really neat vehicle because it's a great relic of the time when there was no sport in utility. This is a utility vehicle. Its competitors at the time, of course, were the Jeep CJ7, the Land Rover Series 2, the International Scout, all real workhorses, all descended quite clearly from their US Jeep military origins. This is by any standard, even at the time, frankly, a fairly crude vehicle. But you know, it's meant to do one thing, and that's to provide absolute going power in difficult conditions. It's reasonable enough to drive on the road. Uh, we just had a great snowstorm here, but the rain overnight has washed away much of the snow. But nevertheless, you know, this is a vehicle that it's interesting, it's characterful, and you never have to worry about getting it dirty. You know, that's what it was designed for, to get dirty. And it's also not bad to drive on the road, cruising here at about 40 miles per hour. I don't think I want to go much faster than this. The gear whine is really present. The 125 horsepower inline six cylinder engine is working as hard as it can just to keep me going right now in, in this normal road conditions. But, you know, it still is, is something that reminds you of sort of the basics of driving. And as people who watch this channel know, I love connected driving. And with a vehicle like this, you have to stay connected. The steering wants to wander a bit all around the road. The windshield wipers are sort of theoretical. I'm not quite sure why they don't uh, actually clear the windshield, but there's got to be a reason. It's sort of more like driving a 1940s car than the car from the 1970s. But the other interesting thing about driving this FJ are the pedals. It's winter, of course. I'm wearing my nice big Canadian boots. And it's got a nice big wide clutch pedal, a nice big wide brake pedal, as you might expect in a vehicle like this for control. It's got a really tiny <coughs> accelerator pedal, metal finish. And the spacing of the pedals is such that when I put my boot on the brake pedal, I can easily heel and toe because my boot is actually touching both at the same time. So who knows, maybe this is a sportier utility than I thought it was. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, it's uh, also something that first gear is a really low gear and even with double clutching, engaging it on the move is something that's uh, sort of chancy at best. Bringing the power of the mighty 125 horsepower inline six to the ground is a three-speed manual transmission. Later models had a four-speed transmission and of course a high and low four-wheel drive system with this handy little lever on the floor that you have to stop the car and then shift into the uh, low range if you need that for uh, rock climbing and uh, getting out of trouble. And of course, it has the inevitable winch on the front, both for towing yourself out of trouble and for getting others out of trouble if they get in over their heads. All the useful accoutrements that come with a utility vehicle like this. Plus, it's got this really neat original AM radio. I can just hear the tunes of the 1970s coming out of this radio. It's fantastic. Like all vehicles of this type, the steering is very direct. It's a 
big steering wheel, but you get action on the steering wheel fairly quickly once you get past the sort of five degree uh, sneeze factor. I see myself, I feel like a Formula One driver warming his tires, but uh, not much is happening here. And compared to the Jeep and the Land Rover, I have to say this, the Toyota is actually much more civilized than either of those two. It's got a, uh, a really solid feel, very Toyota-like, and in fact, this is the vehicle that Toyota used to introduce itself to export markets. It's interesting to know that uh, this car was the best-selling Toyota in the United States until 1965. Toyota manufactured this vehicle from 1960 to 1984 for the entire world, but continued manufacturing it in Brazil until the early 2000s. And it's also uh, quite wonderful to know that uh, in the Venezuelan market, this is marketed as the Toyota Macho. So, uh, you know, you just feel just a little bit more manly, uh, just, just getting behind the wheel of this car, you know? Um, the other thing which is quite interesting about this vehicle, there's a nice shift from second to first, bravo, well done, Donald, is that it wants to go off the road, you know? It doesn't really want to be here on pavement. Its natural element, I think, is, is mud and snow. And it does give you, despite its nervousness on, on asphalt at speed, it does give you a sense of security. You know, to drive on snow is really what this thing wants to do. Here's its element. Now, of course, it may be mostly slush, but nonetheless, it feels at home. And of course, this particular example is also great because it's wrapped. It's wrapped as a very effective commercial advertising vehicle. So you also don't have to worry about stone chips or, or branches scratching it because it's a wrapped car. Another thing which is great about vehicles like this is the fact that they are meant to be driven. There was a great, great craze for these vehicles that happened about 10 or so years ago. All these old FJs had all but disappeared. They were parked in garages, barns, left in people's front yards, and nobody knew about them except for the die-hard people that, that use these cars every day in the mountains and, and, and going to the lakes. And all of a sudden, they began to reappear as cult items. The value skyrocketed overnight. Companies were formed to rebuild these. A lot of them had engine transplants. A Chevy 350 will fit quite neatly underneath the hood. And of course, the later models, this is a 1973, the later models actually came with disc brakes. And oh my god, they even had optional air conditioning and power steering. It's sort of the sport in utility sneaking in towards the end of the production run. But, you know, this is really what it's all about. It's the elemental. This car is, is late enough to have a really comfortable, well-finished interior, but still speaks to that 1960 FJ and its roots in the Jeep CJ and the Land Rover. So I can understand why this is so popular because they have the feel of a Toyota, well-designed, well-built, incredible visibility, very great utility. But it still has that wonderful adventure feel. And what can make a, a winter's driving day more fun than that? You know, even though you may be headed to the office, you could pretend that you've got your snowshoes in the back and uh, a kayak and you're going to break through the ice and do some winter uh, rowing, you know, who knows what could happen. Anything could happen with this uh, vehicle on a day like today. The other interesting thing, of course, about owning and using a vehicle like this is that it's meant to be used. This truck has had its original engine replaced after it suffered a catastrophic failure, but it doesn't affect the value. The same inline six-cylinder engine that the car was born with, the same type, was put back in the car. The thought was given to a V8 swap 
but ultimately it was the character of the Land Cruiser that we wanted to preserve and we did and I'm glad we did. Another Resto Mod FJ, who wants that? We've got this, original. So whether you're driving an all-wheel drive Porsche with 600 horsepower or 125 horsepower Toyota Utility, winter driving should still bring a smile to your face. That's what we're all about. No matter what the season, we're engaged.